good morning to you all it is my great pleasure to introduce brother pedro oliveria before you brother pedro is very well known to indian people not only indian people but throughout the world brother pedro was born in porto alegre brazil in 1957 He holds a degree in philosophy from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Brother Pedro joined Theosophical Society in 1978 at a very early age in Brazil. From 1992 to 1996, he was International Secretary of Theosophical Society at the. Then. subsequently after uh, some years he was officer in charge of editorial office theosophy publishing house international theosophical society at that then he married a sister linda and settled in australia in australia he was appointed as president of indo pacific federation of theosophical society he wrote two books one is a book known as ain siram a life of beneficence and wisdom another c w lidwitter speaks now at present he is education coordinator of the australian section of theosophical society he traveled throughout the world widely many countries including india and other foreign countries he has been delivering uh, lectures on perennial philosophy spirituality mysticism and comparative religion now i invite brother Pedro Oliveira to start his discourse with these words let us welcome brother pedro um uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, brother pradeep mahapatra for this invitation this is the le- the least costly lecture that i have ever given because i don't need to leave my home um i would like to start by saying that those of you who have um read or studied the secret doctrine which is as you know one of the very important books in theosophical literature um you will remember that madam lavatsky stated in the secret doctrine that the position of the human race the human the humanity in the process of evolution is a very important one she says that humanity is one of the 10 creative hierarchies in existence in life in evolution and therefore the process of evolution depends on um humanity uh, uh taking responsibility for its own actions when it doesn't take responsibility every other aspect of the stream of evolution suffers and we have seen this happening before our very eyes there are still people in this world who deny the effects of climate change now this is not a talk about climate change i'm just trying to give you examples but it is undeniable that human action has affected the planet in a very profound way 
several hundred thousand of species, perhaps even some millions of species on earth have been extinguished because of human action. Even in this country, in Australia, um, there, has, there have been countless wars, uh, both in the ancient world as in the modern world. Um, and within humanity itself, relationships have suffered a great deal. So the human being, that means each one of us, has, the human being has an enormous responsibility. And at the very core of this, res this responsibility is how the human mind works. Uh, or in other words, how we allow our mind to function. Uh, I'm going to share with you some passages from different sources, from different teachers, different authors, that highlight the need for a transformation of the human mind. Uh, we had a very dedicated theosophist in Northern Ireland called Dr. Hugh Sherman. The TPH at IDR has a number of his books in catalog. But there is one book that is out of catalog. So I had suggested this in my short talk in uh, Benares during the convention. I would like to renew this suggestion. There is a a book by him, which has been out of print for quite some time, called Modern Theosophy. And in this book, he says, uh, in a very perceptive way, and what he says in his own words uh, is very similar to what Brother Sri Ram said, that he said that the word theosophy can be understood at, in two different meanings. He said, in one, at one level, theosophy, not at one level, at the fundamental level, theosophy is wisdom. In other words, it's not a teaching, a doctrine, an explanation, a chart of human evolution, natural evolution, cosmic evolution. He says, the word literally means divine wisdom. So it is not an ideology, it's not a school of philosophy, it's not a darshana, if you like. Madame Blavatsky, by the way, she said that in India there are six darshanas, but the seventh is Gupta Vidya. That means that wisdom, that is that hidden wisdom that the mind cannot easily access. So Dr. Sherman continue that at, at this fundamental level, transcendental level, theosophy is wisdom. And wisdom cannot be defined. Why? Because the nature of wisdom lies in a dimension beyond the mind, where definitions take place. Or as Krishna Ji used to say, the word is not the thing. Right? So whenever, it is all right to use concepts and categories, we need that. But we also need to recognize that there is something so profound that the mind cannot 
define. The, the mind cannot even reach it. And that is theosophy at its essential level. At a secondary level, he said, theosophy is ancient wisdom, a body of teachings expressed in books, articles, pamphlets, booklets, nowadays websites, blogs, and so on. And this, uh, uh, this categorization of Dr. Hugh Sherman is very important because we can all be familiar with theosophical teachings without reaching the real meaning of theosophy. And Dr. Besson very eloquent, eloquently said that the theosophical life has to be a life of service. And that was not an ideological statement. She said, we are helped. Our lives depend on help that we receive from many sources in existence. The food we eat, the clothes we wear, the materials that build our house, the hospitals, the doctors, the nurses, today like never before, perhaps. So we receive, she said, we receive so much. And if we, know, if we don't try to give back, she said, we become like thieves that just receive, get, and don't return it in service. So she also said this in a graduation ceremony of Indian students. And she said that India would only experience a complete regeneration when those who have been educated for the, with the sacrifice of millions who didn't get education, those who have received education, they have to return that education a selfless service. In other words, if we obtain the gift of knowledge, academic knowledge, we cannot say, oh, I don't owe anything to anybody because I have, I have paid for my degree. Dr. Bezen said, that's not true. Because many didn't have access to this gift of knowledge. So, this is an important point. And um, what we are going to see here is how these different authors and teachers, how they, they, they found and they share with others this need for the human mind to be transformed. Brother G used to say, she actually wrote that in an editorial, and you will find this in the book, The World Around Us, which was uh, very well edi edited by Professor Shindi at IDR. In one of her editorials, she said that when theosophy becomes just a set of ideas, it ceases to be a light. It becomes another form of ideology. So let us con let us continue. Um, and the first quote comes from Jalaluddin Rumi, one of the greatest mystical poets of all time. He wrote in his book Masnavi, "O man of double vision, hearken with attention." Seek a cure for your defective sight by listening. I'll repeat. O man of double vision, hearken with attention. Seek a cure for your defective sight by listening. By double vision, he means someone who is stuck in duality which means all of us, a man or a human being of double vision, duality. That is me, and then there, is, there are others, and nothing bridges this gap between me and others. And then he says, hearken with attention. A number of these teachers and mystics, they, 
when they write something, sometimes they repeat this expression, listen, pay attention. Because what they are going to say is very important. He said, hearken with attention. Seek a cure for your defective sight by listening. What causes this defective perception is the lack of listening. And listening has different levels. It has been said, it was reported as an accurate fact that during the tsunami that hit Southeast Asia in 2004, some elephants in Thailand who had tourists on their back, I personally don't approve of this kind of tourism that exploits elephants, but these tourists were on the elephant's back and when the tsunami was about to hit, these elephants stopped and they, they were, they, they were, they paused their movement and they were very attentive and suddenly they ran for the hills and they saved a number of lives because when the, when the, the, the tsunami hit, it was a, a, a calamity, a catastrophe. So animals have this capacity. They pay attention. Probably in terms of evolution, they had to learn to do that in order to survive because predators are there. But they develop, they have developed this capacity to listen, to pay attention. And, and that for them is vital. Now, for us, it is important to say that, and you can test the, the validity of this statement in your own life. In, in, in many cases, when we are talking to someone, we are not paying full attention. And when that person is talking, we are already editing in your, our brain our reply. And therefore, uh, we are not listening. Let alone that in many cases, when people are talking, um, an argument can easily take place because bes be besides this lack of attention, there is, there is also this inbuilt foolish tendency to score points on another human being in a conversation. It is said that um, Winston Churchill was a master of witticisms and he was a member of the Conservative Party in England and there was a member of the Labour Party, a lady called Bessie Braddock, who didn't like Churchill and she didn't miss an opportunity to express her dislike for him. So on one occasion in Parliament she said, Winston, I am mad at you and if I were your wife, I would put poison in your coffee. And Winston Churchill said, and I would drink it. Of course, he, he, his exit out of that uh, conflagration was through humor. But it's very, this happens uh, uh, in many, many times. If you really listen to someone, there is no need for argument. Why? Because if you don't agree with, with the argument of that person, you don't need to try to convince that person of your own argument. If you don't agree, as the old saying says, just agree to disagree. Right? So, this is just one aspect of listening. Another aspect is, is it possible for us 
to listen to your own to our own emotions to our own thoughts to our own tendency to dwell in the past this is also there very much so isn't it this is what mr krishnamurti called the chattering mind the chattering mind even if we are not talking about things the chattering mind goes on all the time and it prevents us from listening i would like to move on uh, in one of the Upanishads, I, I, I didn't, I, somehow I couldn't locate which Upanishad it is, but I'm sure um, a number of you know. The question was asked, how can the self be known? By the word self is meant Atma. How can the true self be known? And the answer was, Shravana Manana nididhyasana by listening reflecting meditating so it is a process right you cannot jump to the last stage perhaps very few people can but you have to start with listening why because listening creates order in the mind Listening, st stop the chattering, the useless chattering that we fill our minds with and creates this space of observation, of sense. Certain people, great sages, lived in that state, like Sridharmana Maharshi. He didn't have much need to speak. So, Shravana is translated as listening. Manana is translated as reflection. Now, reflection doesn't mean to just oppose thoughts and ideas. Reflection, it has been suggested, is the capacity to look at something from different angles, from different points of view. That is Manana. It also purifies the mind it, it turns the mind it, it makes the mind more responsive to the truth of things and the, the real reflection which is manana is not personal when we turn reflection into a personal exercise it's not reflection. We are just uh, once again indulging in self centeredness. So, reflection is the capacity. First, it starts with listening, then, it, 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 it moves on to this, cap this capacity to reflect, to ponder, right? For example, there are some statements in the theosophical literature that could be pondered for many years, if not for a lifetime. One of them is in the book Light on the Path, very well known. And the statement is, to work for self is to work for disappointment. And disappointment because the self in us is a walking bundle of contradictions. We want certain things, we want to avoid others, we want certain things that we cannot have, or when we do get them, we want more. This, this was the fundamental insight of Lord Buddha, according to the tradition. He could see at a very deep level in human consciousness that the thirst for more experiences 
is the mother of all suffering. This wanting more. And if, if the mind is caught in this, this is what samsara is, isn't it? I did some research and I found a very interesting definition of samsara, aimless wandering. That's, that's what samsara is. It, is. it is to live without a purpose, to be tossed to and fro by circumstances, being unable to define a direction in life, and therefore indulging in this pattern again and again until one dies and then is reborn, and those patterns affirm themselves again and again. So samsara is aimless wandering, which means that samsara is our mind. And on the other hand, Nagarjuna, the great, one, of the, one of the greatest philosophers of Buddhism, Nagarjuna said, paradoxically, samsara is nirvana, nirvana is samsara. The difference is how the mind looks, how the mind looks at the world and at itself. So this is the need for us to really become serious about the transformation of the mind. Now, leaving the Indian tradition for a while, we go to uh, one of the greatest mystics in the Christian tradition, Meister Eckhart, who had this very profound insight. He said, whatever is familiar to you is your foe. Foe means enemy, F-O-E. Whatever is familiar to you is your foe. So if, we, if the mind gets accustomed with familiarity, it stops listening, it stops reflecting, it stops contemplating. It has been caught by the enemy of familiarity. Somebody asked uh, an American biologist many years ago for his definition of a tree, and he said, as a biologist, I cannot give an, any definition of a tree. I can talk about the accidents of a tree, the texture of the bark, the nature of the leaves, the interaction between the tree and the weather, winter, spring, summer, and so on, with the crystals and minerals in the soil, with the wind, but these are all descriptions of what happens to the tree. I can't tell you what a tree is. Why? Because uh, another gr a great uh, uh, um, European philosopher, Immanuel Kant, said, we cannot think about the thing in itself. You know? That which is, uh, th that which exists in itself. Perhaps, I don't know if Kant had studied Sanskrit, but that would be more or less a good definition of Swarupa, the essential nature of something. We can describe that. So, whatever is familiar to you is your foe. A mind that is on the way to transformation does not allow this kind of armored concrete of familiarity to deter it, to mold it. This mind is fresh. It keeps looking. It keeps learning. It's a mind that never grows old. The body may grow old, that's part of life. There is no problem in that. But the mind can be alive. 
another author from Europe is a Jewish theologian called Martin Buber. He wrote a very important book uh, in the middle of last century called I and Thou, T-H-O-U, I and Thou. That means it's a book about our relationship with the sacred, with life. And he said, all actual life is encounter, meeting. Life only exists when there is meeting, connection, encounter. And of course, a condition in mind stands in the way from, of this encounter, of this meeting. Other authors have said that life can only happen in the present. It cannot happen in the past. Some of us would like to edit our past. We can't do that. Life doesn't happen in the future, which doesn't exist from all practical purposes. Life only happens in the present moment. And he said, all actual life is encounter. To come back to the example of the tree, this tree can only remain alive if it is encountering or meeting the elements, the wind, the sun, the mineral, it becomes home for many, many insects and other creatures like birds and so on. Geoffrey Barborka was a very profound student of the secret doctrine. And in his book, The Divine Plan, which is in print in the Theosophical Publishing House at Adyar, he said that one of the cardinal one of the cardinal rules of existence and of evolution is that each being lives within the consciousness of another being. We have countless numbers of bacteria and other organisms within our body. For, for, uh, for which it's important for us to, to exist. And, and we live our lives within the body and the consciousness of Mother Earth. But, but in, many, in many occasions, we are not very kind to our Mother Earth, right? So much so that some biologists have said that in certain places of Earth, the destruction has reached a point near irreversibility because of human action. Well, we'll continue. I mentioned Sri Ramana Harshi before, and in, in his beautiful booklet, Who Am I? He says, when one persistently inquires into the nature of the mind, the mind will end leaving the self as the residue. The self is Atma. So the end of this inquiry, which he called Vichara in Sanskrit, investigation, probing, the end of this inquiry, at the end of this inquiry into the nature of the mind, the mind ends as it exists today. That means as conditioning, suspicion, anger, in some cases even hatred, fear. All this inquiry suggested by Sri Ramana Maharshi ends all that. And the residue of the inquiry, what remains, is Atma. So this is this is the complete transformation in his own words. Some people have expressed shock with the statement that the mind will end, saying that, uh, do I become mindless? 
Of course, I don't have the permission of Sri Ramana Maharshi to say that, but we are mindless now by insisting on a life of self-centeredness and selfishness, which is so unnatural, so uh, conflicted. So, this is what true inquiry is, according to him. It is an inquiry that causes the mind to reflect on itself more and more, so that gradually all the foundations of selfishness, self-centeredness, pride, conceit, they are gradually dismantled by this inquiry. And what is left? It's who we are, the self Atman. Once uh, Dr. Rene Weber, a very distinguished American theosophist, had an interview with Krishnamurti and she asked, she said to him, many people find your teachings very hard to implement. Why do you think that is? And Mr. Krishnamurti said to her, because they don't want it. In other words, they prefer to live their own lives in conditioned grooves and so on. And of course, then they had a, a full conversation. This is in, in a book called Questioning Krishnamurti. You can Google it. Um, but the same could be said uh, uh, regarding other teachers, right? Um, there are many people in the world who claim to be Christians but if you would ask them, are you really living according to the precept that Jesus put forward, love thy neighbor as thyself? That would be a tough one. Some people will say, well, perhaps he didn't, he didn't mean that specifically, that was just notional. And if you go to the gospel, he meant it. There is a story in the gospel which is very emblematic of the world today. A young man came to Jesus and said, show me the way to eternal life. And Jesus said to him, observe the commandments. And this young man said, oh, I have observed the commandments since I was a child. Show me the way to eternal life. So then Jesus looked at him and said, go sell everything you have, distribute it to the poor, the poor, and then come and follow me. And the text of the gospel says that the young man went away sorrowful because he had many properties, many belongings. So, it is one thing to pay superficial allegiance to this kind of teachings without recognizing that the real teachers, they mean business. They don't come into this world to pat, pat us in the back, to give us a kind of a pastime. They come for transformation. Because probably they have realized that if the human mind doesn't transform itself, there is very little hope for the world. Then we have another statement very well known from Light on the Path. Listen to the song of life. Listen to the song of life. 
And there is an explanatory note there saying that when you first try to listen, you will only hear a cacophony of sounds. Then the, 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 the book says, stop and listen deeper than that. And the book says, in the, in, in the very heart, in, at the very heart, at the very base of your nature, you will find faith, hope, and love. Not at the surface, because at the surface, the surface has been rented by the personal mind and it refuses to, to vacate. But at the very source, at the very heart of our consciousness, there is faith, hope, and love. These are the three words that St. Paul immortalized in his epistle to the Corinthians. So listen to the song of life. And the book also says, if you try to, to listen in your own heart, you will find this disharmony. If you try to, to listen in, some, in other people's lives and hearts, you will also find the disharmony. He said, stop and listen again. From the point of view of light on the path, life is not an accident. It is not a random phenomena. Some biologists believe that, in, uh, impelled by materialism. Life is not a random phenomena. Life is not uh, an accident. It's a song. This is what the book is saying. And the word song brings to mind harmony. And if you can go to a quiet place, and of course, those of us who lived at Adyar, we had an experience every day. The entire place is suffused by the harmony of nature. And I still remember walking with Radha G there, how her eyes would see that and her heart would see that. And, and, and she, she said to me that, uh, uh, that she feels this harmony of blessedness at Adyar all the time. So this is what life is. According to this great teaching, it's a song. Um, a song also evokes beauty, isn't it? I was exposed to certain devotional songs in India that I can never forget. And they were profoundly beautiful. So that's what life is. So if we could see at least something of this, our own life would be different. And finally, you know, St. Paul was, uh, St. Paul is not very popular among quite a number of Christian women because they are upset with him but because he, he said that women should wear hats in the church and so on. Of course, I can, I can sympathize with, the, with that view, but uh, he was probably mirroring the, the, the social custom at that time. As Dr. Ravi Ravindra said, if St. Paul only had written about women in the church, we wouldn't pay attention to him. But he, he wrote about many other things. And um, he, he, he once wrote to one of the Christian communities that he made himself all things to all people. He could mingle with Gentiles, with, with, the, with the Jews, uh, with the Greek, with the Romans. And he said that he, he did that because he wanted to take the teachings of Christ with, with him. And when he arrived in Athens, 
there was a controversy there because some people were persecuting Christians. He, he gave a speech and he said, why are you persecuting these Christians who worship a God that you don't know when you have here in Athens a temple dedicated to the unknown God? Which is true, the, there was such a temple in Athens at that time. So he, he was a, a very great man and he he experienced complete transformation. And, uh, excuse me. Before he became a Christian, an apostle of Christ, he was, his job was to locate Christians, arrest them and send them to the governor of Palestine at that time. So he was hunting Christians. And so he was on the road to Damascus, which is Syria nowadays. I don't think St. Paul would be able to do that job nowadays because, as you know, there, were, there is a very brutal civil war in Syria. So he was on the road to Damascus with others. And suddenly he said, a light shown over him, a very bright light. And from the center of that light, a voice said to him, why do you persecute me, Paul? Now, mind you, this man was, he was not for Christian, Christianity at all. He, he was arresting and hunting Christians. When that voice said that to him, without hesitation, he said, is that you, Lord? So he knew that that voice who speak, spoke to him was Christ himself. And then the, the light went away. He, the, the scripture says that he was blind for three days. According to Madame Blavatsky, these are all symbolic, symbolic representation of a very profound initiation. And whenever she refers to St. Paul in her writings, both in the Secret Doctrine or the Key to Theosophy or the Collected Writings, she calls, me, calls him the, the Christian Initiate. So um, he was blind. He was taken to the house of a, another Christian called Ananias and he recovered there and he, when he leaves the house, he's not Saul anymore, Saul of Tarsus, he is Paul. And he was complete, completely transformed. And this is what he wrote to the Corinthians on chapter 15, verse 30, 31st. He said, I die daily. I die daily. This is very similar to what Sri Ramana Maharshi said. The mind has ended, only the self is left behind. So, every day, in his practice, in his faith, in his devotions, he would die psychologically for all the accumulated experience. And, and he, he left behind a body of teachings that is very, very inspiring. And he said in, in the epistle to the Corinthians, which I mentioned before, he said, now we know in part, 
now we know in part through as if through a glass darkly that's how our mind works like a thick dark glass and not as a direct perception now i know in part but then when the transformation comes i i will know as i am known by the divine if you like so i think all these uh, teachers and poets and and authors they have um highlighted the fact that unless the human mind w transforms itself um the world will be postponed but if if the mind can start this journey of self transformation then that is that is uh, uh a great deal of hope uh, just to to finish with the words of saint paul um um uh, and now there are these three faith hope and love but the greatest of this is love thank you